Am I the only chicken out here? Yep. You're the only chicken out there. Right now, you're the only one who's joined the Zoom meeting. So we are, going. We, are we are live and we are recording. Okay. Right and next week I'm coming. Uh, Yay! Send me the Zoom sign on with the Zoom link. Yes. yes. Can you send me the Zoom link? I can do that. I can uh, send so it to you. So you don't need the join number or anything mm -hmm. like that? Not for the website. Okay. Not for the recording. You will send me what I need. What? Tell me what to do. Okay. Uh, well, the I first thing we're going to do is we're going to start on our homework from session two, yeah, week problems. two. It uh, starts I on page here next week. 54. And um, Sharon Johnson, you're, you're new to us and the way that we're doing this is when we uh, do our Bible study, we are not going through page by page. What we're doing is when you're doing your study, if you have something on a specific page that you want to uh, discuss, I'm suggesting that you um, tab the page and indicate on that page what it is that you're wanting to point out to the rest of us. And then we're gonna discuss those things. So I don't know if, um, you have the ability to do that from where you've already taken your notes or not, but we're going to start. Uh, like I said, on page 54, she's got a really neat little graph, and I like graphs because I'm a graph person. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I kind of like it. Um, so we'll start here in the group in the, the studio. What's the first tab that you have marked on this? On the graph thing? Or just no, on, in, in session two. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, which, whichever I did, one. I did day one, page 56, where it says, but it seems wisdom without obedience to God does not produce the kind of life God wants us to lead. Yeah, five of them. I got that circle. I thought that was pretty significant. First thing, I'll get the Okay. Page 56. Next to the bottom section. Wisdom without obedience to God does not produce the kind of life God wants us to lead. So you can be as wise as anybody, like Solomon, but if you don't do what you're supposed to do, like Solomon, then... It doesn't produce. It doesn't produce a good life. Right, and then we, it just kind of falls back on page fifty-seven in that second to the bottom paragraph, first two sentences. It's not enough to receive wisdom. Yep. Have wisdom, teach wisdom, or preach wisdom. Right. We <clears> must <throat> do what the word of the Lord says personally and authentically. I mean, I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Sharon going to join in? She may. I'm, I'm still trying to catch up what, what, the way y'all are doing it. Yeah. Because uh, she doesn't have it marked like we do. So if you're just going through and you see something if, and you want to point it out, if you have it like highlighted or starred in your book, go right ahead. I, okay. I don't know that, that Sharon, but I am finding it easier. This, was, this week was easier to go through I the back. Yeah, I agree. Mm. And the dog <laughs> 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 Page 63. Page 63. Okay, in the middle where it says, this makes me. Okay. Okay, ready to talk? Yes. yes. Okay, got, got it. Halfway under one. This makes me take a step back and feel challenged in the deeper motivations I had. Maybe we can dare to be honest together for a moment. No matter who we are and what our calling are, we influence the people. Friends influence friends. Moms influence kids, spouses influence each other. Our work influences those following us on social media. Big and small, we cause some sort of chain reaction that the influences we have. 
Yes. I had underlined that second paragraph too. The second paragraph? Where it said friends, influence, friends. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. I have the friends, influence, friends part. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I have that page marked also. <clears throat> and I, the, at the top, it said, the question she asked is looking back at 1 Kings 11.38, what had God promised Jeroboam and what were the conditions? And what he promised him was, if you obey my rules and commands, then you will continue to be king and a successful king. And then um, where Jenny, just above where Jenny had marked, um, the second full paragraph where it says, this is a repeated <coughs> pattern of these kings, these men of influence who had such an opportunity to do so much good somewhere deep inside of them, their motivation shifted away from God and they led people astray. And my first thought on that was like, okay, so were the people just sheep and they just followed whatever the king said? Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess Pretty so. Much. Because Pretty they much. wanted a king to begin with. They wanted somebody to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. I guess they didn't want to think for themselves. But then I thought, well, you know, we think about those kings as being men of influence, but aren't we people of influence too? I mean, we may not be kings or presidents or senators, but we still influence, like you read, our friends, mm -hmm. each other and even on social media. So down at the bottom, she said, take a moment and jot down some people that you influence. You may have individuals or you may have spheres of influence and list whatever is apl applicable for you. So did anyone do that? No one made a graph or a chart? No, oh man, I did. I, I, I did. I did. <laughs> I did, I made Marla me a little graph. Will. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I made a list. So, did you? Yeah. Okay, read us your list. Tell uh, us yours. The people that inspired me or me inspired them. What, they did, got backwards. what did you do? I said the ones that inspired me. Well, that's okay. okay. You're backwards. Well, go ahead. Um, a list of people. Are my parents, Kenny K. Messner, Hanky Brister, Christy Kenneth, uh, my youth director, King, my teachers, Mrs. Crump and Mrs. Mendel, and Shirley. You know, I want to get Charlize and also Liz with that. Oh, okay. So you listed people who influenced you. So you kind of went from you back, 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 back like that. Yeah. I listed people that I influence. And when she talks about spheres, I'm thinking whether we each have different roles. We have our role as a spouse. We have our role as a parent. We have our role as a employee. We have a role in our church and any other organization or, ha or hobbies that we're involved in. So I kind of drew each of those spheres and put what it was that the people that I had influenced um, over. And so I just thought it was interesting because at first you don't think that you're, you're influential to other people, but if you sit and write down all the people that you've had influence over, whether it be good or bad, <laughs> you know, there's quite a few people that we come across. I mean, look, just look at your social media page. How many friends do you have on your social media? Anything you write on there is influencing those people. Or annoying. Or annoying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in that case, they snooze you. <laughs> That's I think we influence more people than we realize, mm -hmm. and we have to be careful about how we live our life. That's true. I think you can almost say that any person you come in contact with, don't you dare, <laughs> you, you have the potential to influence them just in a daily interaction. Mm -hmm. You go to the grocery store, somebody's in line, you're kind to them or say, hello, how's your day? Absolutely. You may, have, you may have made an influence there not knowing that that's exactly what you've done, but it may have meant something to that person because you may be the first person that ever spoke to them that day. Mm -hmm. You know, when you walk by them, do you look like, do you give them that eye roll or, but it's, it's little bitty things. Influence is not a great big thing. It can be a very minute thing. So 
I'm kind of in agreement with Sharon. I think you touch people all the time, mm -hmm. whether you realize it or not. Used to, you could just smile at someone. Oh yeah, and it would, it, and it would influence them. I mean, it would brighten their day. Well, you can't Nowadays, you can't smile because you can't. You're wearing a mask. Yeah, <laughs> you don't even know what they really look like. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I keep hoping that when I smile at people with my mask on, that they'll see my eyes squint and know that I'm actually there smiling underneath my mask. There you go. <laughs> Uh, I told a lady at Walmart the other day, I said, I'm smiling. <laughs> she says, I am too. Yay. <laughs> we need a mask with a smile on it, don't we? They have those. Do they? They also have a clear area where you can actually see the mouth. Uh -huh. I would like to have one of those. I'll have to we look and see. All right, so let's move on. Who's got uh, another page that they have marked or would like to bring something up? Part on 60, okay, 64 and 65. Page 64. Is it easy to start? To yeah. Page 64, the bottom paragraph in the black print. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to start out with great intentions, but over time we have real motivations. Our motivations get tainted. We develop a deep affinity for wanting what we want in the way we want it and the time when we want it. We also have a deep affinity for shining affirmations for our identity rather than just resting secure in our identity of Christ. And then on 65 at the very top, in the middle of the paragraph on the top, I go, every choice every we choice. make has an internal motivation that's either pure or tainted. It's good to constantly check ourselves and be honest with what we see. Can you think of an example for those intentions? I mean, we intend to be one way, but then... Um, maybe, I, you know, I... I something I, I also have had a hard time doing on this is when it says, well, think of examples for yourself. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you just don't want to think of those examples or, or what, but. Um, yeah. No, I didn't really put down any example. I just I didn't figured. Either. Okay, well, that's yeah. fine. I couldn't really think of an example there. Hi, somebody's somebody joined us. Fam Bam. Mel. Okay, so I'm gonna, Fam Bam, I, I see you've joined us. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you for just a moment um, so we don't have the background noise. And then when you want to um, communicate with us, just give me a heads up or send me a, a chat and let me know, okay? <clears throat> so, um, my next page that I had marked was page 68, and I just noted here <coughs> that up at that top paragraph, I underline that the, the first sentence, it says, it was a created solution to help ease his fear. And Jer then the last sentence of that same paragraph, Jeroboam was terrified of his people turning their hearts toward this other king and his own power being threatened. So when he first became king, it was because God put him there. Mm -hmm. But then he became so enamored, I guess, with his power that he became fearful of them losing power because he was thinking that if they went back to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship, they would leave him and go back to uh, Rehoboam, the other king. Um, and I don't know they because- just, They were both just as bad. That, and so what if they wanted to go to the temple? That's where God told them to go. And I'm just thinking, you know, why did he create 
high places for other gods, why not just create a mini temple? Or, you know, used to the temple before Solomon built the original temple was in a tent. Why didn't he just put a tent up and say, okay, this is God's temple. This is where God wants us to worship instead of using other gods for the people to worship in. I just, I couldn't understand that except that he just didn't trust that God was true to his word. Just keep falling back into that same, uh, just the same old thing that we fall into every thing. Well, and see, Solomon did that the whole time that he was there. He let all the wives and everybody and built those high places. I'm thinking whoever went to the temple, I don't know. Maybe they went to the temple and then went to the high places to cover all their bases. And they could have. It may have been. Didn't they talk about the fact at some point, not in the study, that people would go to different idols for the different things different that they wanted? Yeah. yeah. Fertility, Fertility and water and, and sun. And, and I mean, you couldn't leave one out. You had to hit your, I guess you had to hit them all just so you make sure you have everything. Okay, then the next page uh, is uh, that I marked was on page 70. I got 69. Okay, go back to 69. 69. The, um, Right in the middle. Uh -huh. uh, I only point out these examples because at different times in my life, I've struggled with them personally. And remember, we are choosing to examine the patterns of distrust we find in these ancient kings to make us more aware of places in our own hearts where we are also distrusting God. Mm -hmm. I think somebody just pointed out to you just while we were doing this story. <laughs> Well, she does use two examples oh. there. <laughs> um, so most of the time, she asks all these questions. Well, now, where are you doing this? And, and I and I keep struggling with the edges. So they said, just come along, put it out to me, and I'll take, I'll take it, you know, and I'll work on it. <laughs> it says, we do things all the time to protect ourselves. It's easy for us to justify an action for our protection. We must say it's for the benefit of the other people when it's in reality for our own manipulative attempt to control our situation and circumstances. Mm, we try to protect ourselves yeah. and keep things in our control. Around us to get and keep what we want. The sad thing is that's just human nature. Human nature. It's protect, life. protect, protect, family. protect self from her, protect somebody, you know, I just think that's normal. And we, we want to be able to fix it. Mm -hmm. We want it to be able to uh, not see our family or anybody in our close realm mm -hmm. suffer. Mm -hmm. We don't want to see them be unhappy. So we try and fix it for them. So then over on page 70, it says, let me read my note. My note says, why? It's easy to forget to go for, a, oh, it's easy to forget and instead seek a life of ease and comfort, which is what I think Jeroboam was doing. He wanted to make it easy on the people so they could worship there in their own town instead of going all the way back to Jerusalem. And the people, I think a lot of the people who left Jerusalem to begin with were the ones who were what we call oppressed because they had built the temple. And you remember when, when Rehoboam became king, they said, your father Solomon oppressed us, made us work really hard, lighten our load, please. And he says, no, I'm going to make it harder on you. So they were escaping that hardship, that hard work. So I think they were looking for a life of, of ease and comfort is what they were looking for. And so Jeroboam wanted to make it easy for them and comfortable for them to worship where he was so that they wouldn't want to go back there. Well, God told them in the beginning that that's what would happen. <laughs> From the get go, from the get the beginning, that if you take a God, this is what's going to happen to your people. You're going to be enslaved. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. So here we are. 
71, oftentimes our sins are repetitive. Thank you, that. Jeroboam didn't come <laughs> up with anything new here. He was doing the yep. same thing that Aaron did in the wilderness, the same thing that Solomon did when he, even after he built God's temple. And at the bottom of page 71, the it says read Acts 7 11. Whether you are leading or being led, we are each responsible to know God's word and to live it out. How are you examining your days using God's word in light of today's lesson? How does this challenge you personally? Acts 17. I didn't know I didn't read that. 17 11. 17 11. Read it to us if you can find it. These were more half-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched for the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were comparing scripture to what they were being told is the way I understand that. So they were verifying that what they were being taught or what they were being told was true to the scripture. Is that what you understand it to say? They were verifying stuff, yeah. I mean, they were questioning. Right, right, questioning it, making sure. Because how many times have you heard someone say, money is the root of all evil? You hear it a bunch, but that's a Not misquote of the Bible. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is not evil. It's just the thing. But it's how much we love it more than we love God, how much we love so, it. Okay, so they give misquotes versus for the love of money, right? Right. And the misquote is? Money is the root of all evil. Okay. Yeah. And so unless you go look it up, you don't know. I mean, I, I just give um, our church as an example because we don't turn in our Bibles when the, when the preacher reads the, the, the scripture. If we had our Bible, we would read it. They put it on the screen and it's whatever version, you know, that the church uses. But I, I was taught at a very young age that you always have your Bible and you always read along because your Bible might say something different than what they read to you right. or they might not read it correctly or they might skip a word. I mean, the only word missing out of that quote is love, right? right. So it's, it's always been important to me to go back and look it up. And then sometimes if I hear something whether it's on a video like we're watching now or if it's in church or if it's just somebody quoting uh, what they say is a Bible verse, I always like to go look it up just to see if it's true or not because a lot of people, whether they mean to or not, misquote Bible verses. So, like I want to be submissive to her husband. Yeah. <laughs> that there's more to that verse than that. <laughs> it, it hinges on that kind of like what God said, or like we've just studying that yes. you can have all the wisdom in the world, but if you don't obey, it's not going to do you any good. And if you just use a piece of a of scripture and you just single out what you want it to say, but you don't read the rest of it, it's not the truth, is it? Because no. you have to have all of it together for it to be the truth. All right, so Sharon Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Got any more pages that you want to point out? No, I'm okay. just I'm following along here. All right, sounds good. Well, I went to 72, and it just goes back to everything yeah. that we've talked about. Where um, in the small first paragraph, it says, Sadly, Jeroboam allowed his heart to manipulate his thoughts and fell prey to the temptation to take control of things himself. Yep.
I'm down 73 at the bottom. 73. Mm -hmm. The cap, the part she has highlighted here. Whatever captivates our hearts, moves our actions. Yes. <coughs> Whatever we are momentarily obsessed with. <laughs> Sometimes our obsessions are momentarily. Between one day and the next, we have something different. Something happens every day, yep. Yeah. Over on page 76, she has us look up several Bible verses there. Well, on page 75, she gives the instructions. Look up the following verses and jot down a few notes about each truth you can use to practice remembering when you return to fear, doubt, or the desire to control. Which on page 75, she's got a, a, a little graph there. And she asks us, she said, when you read through these, which one of these three do you tend to lean towards the most? It depends on the day. Really? The situation. Um, yeah. and it depends, it on, depends the on the situation. situation and the circumstances, the, circumstances the day. Of it. Yeah. I'd probably lean more towards doubt than the other, but. Doubt. I kind of did, like, like Sherry said, I want to get pain I can, in there. I can, I, when I was working, uh -huh. I was a whole lot more controlling. Oh. Then I, in, in a, like, like the church, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be a, a, a Martha. I'm going to be in the kitchen behind everybody else. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But at work, I was very much a controller. So, no, you, you do it right and do it this way. And, my desk had to be, everything on my desk was in a certain place in a certain deal. And nice. My house isn't anything like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, a lot of times it does depend on the situation where you are, what you're doing. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I, I agree because I've had all three of those fear, doubt, and control. Mm -hmm. But I think the one that affects me the most is um, control. I think that's the one that I have to work the hardest at. Because when I'm afraid, I think God is my first go to. And when I am in doubt about His well, his goodness and, and whether or not he's going to come through for me, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it, then I usually turn to prayer and scripture to look at that. But control, <clears throat> that's something that I do without even thinking. Um, somebody who really influenced me was Sarah Jacobson. When I came to this church, she was, um, she wasn't, she was the children and what'd they call her? It's her, she did the Sunday schools and she did the children's Sunday school too. And I don't really remember what her title was, but I remember coming in and I had two little kids and she came up to me and, and she said, I, I'd love to visit with you a little bit. And so we talked for a few minutes and she said, can I pray with you? And I said, well, sure. Yeah. And so she prayed and she said that she was asking God to show me what my role in the church was going to be. And I mean, I'm new to the church. I'm brand new to the Methodist church. And so she did that. And then you know, we, we came to church, we, we were continuing in church, and then about, I'd say, four or five months later, she, said, she asked me, she said, I've prayed about this, and she said, I think God wants you to teach Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. Huh. Oh, mine was BBS. 
<laughs> oh, that's Carol. Where'd Bam Bam go? Yeah. Car okay. It's me. Oh, hi, Carol. Hey, Carol. Were you Fam Bam? I was Fam Bam. I was trying okay. to figure out how to change my name. <laughs> and, I, and I figured it out. <laughs> well, now you've done it. So now we see now that we you're with us. Ones. Okay. Sounds Man, good. I don't know how to get my photo up there. So I'm just sitting here listening. Okay. okay. Well, that's fine. You can, you can holler at Steve later and he'll help you figure that out. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Well, but going back to doubt a little bit. Uh huh. I don't. That's my problem. Doubting God. I doubt myself. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. My thing. That's my. That's I'm my going thing. to doubt myself and my ability, and and even in my reading this writer, am I studying this writer? Am I getting the right thing? Am I doing it the right way? I don't ever doubt that God's there. And that I can get to him and, and all of that. I'm my doubt is in me and my myself. Mm -hmm. Myself. Myself. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. That's what I said. Yeah. Oh, I definitely favorite. understand that. Well, with all that said, I was leading up to page 76 where she asked us to look at all those Bible verses. And <laughs> I don't know if you had a chance to look them up, but if you don't mind, I'd like to read them. Sure. Okay. Is that okay? Proverbs 29, 25. I got back to one or two, but I didn't get them all. Okay. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of mankind is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. And then Romans 8, 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. And I don't know about you, but I, Romans 8, 38 through 39, <clears throat> that, that one in my Bible is highlighted, starred, the pages turned over. I mean, that is one of my absolute favorite verses is that there is nothing that I do or nothing that anyone else can do that is going to separate me from God. So to me, that's, that's just, I love those verses that she picked out for us to, to look at. All right. Anybody else have another place they want to bring up? I haven't, I never did quite get with her on this. She it starts it on 77 with the, the, our souls crave to be filled like our stomachs do. Our stomachs were made for food. Our souls were made to be nourished by God's word. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew that. Yeah. And we must start training our brains to recognize soul hunger. I'm just explain that to me. How would I, how do you recognize that? I would just think what she was trying to say is that our that our internal being really needs more of God's word and and right yeah that, that's, I got that's 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 like, how do we train our minds or our, our brains to know that that's the part I recognize that you need to that. notice to notice it to be still and to notice that you need it you said the key word be still be still I think of that uh, that soul searching because so many people today, and I'll just use an example. People are looking for love it's everywhere, all the wrong places. All the wrong wrong places. places. That's right. Mm -hmm. They're looking for love everywhere because they're thinking that if they can just find that physical love, that it'll fill that empty <laughs> spot inside of them. 
And that's not what they need. They need the love of God who accepts them just as they are, because you can find somebody to love in the world, but they may not accept you as you are, or they, they may walk away from you at some point. I'm not saying that will ever happen to you, but it could. But God's love is forever and ever, and it's always there. Sometimes you just feel lonely. I mean, have you ever been someplace and you were in a room with other people and all of a sudden you're just lonely and you're thinking everybody else is talking to everybody else and I'm just all by myself and nobody's talking to me. Yeah. And you feel like nobody. You feel so insignificant. Or at least it's happened to me. And it's just we're looking for someone to fulfill us. First two paragraphs on 78 were 78. And those two, that talking about that recognizes the soul hunger. And, okay. And that our souls were designed by God to receive and be nourished by the truth of God. Yes. I think a lot of times, you know, if you just step back, like you said, just step back and take a, a minute yeah. to realize that everything's kind of going down in a handbasket and I need some help here. And mm -hmm. it's time that, you know, it's kind of, it's time to stop and be quiet and spend some time with God mm -hmm. instead of. Or if things are going all wrong. Yeah. Sometimes it just seems like everything's yeah, going everything wrong. Is, yeah, so it's time to sit back and be quiet and do some reading or spend some, you know. Makes me think of COVID. All of a sudden, everything's wrong, mm -hmm. and it's time for us to talk to God about it, <laughs> you know? All right. Hey, Carla. Yes, ma'am. I liked on 78, the, uh, it's a little bit further down on that page, but it says you will not be nourished until you actually ingest and digest it for yourself. The same is true for scripture. You must take in God's word for yourself. Nobody can really tell you about it until you really dig in to the word and take it in. That's when it speaks to you. That's when your soul is nourished, I think. Mm hmm he said, that's why I often ask you to turn to read from the Bible. I want you to see the truth of scripture in a personal way, because it, it can be applied so personally to you and really what you're going through that day. That's why it's so important to dig into the word yourself. Well, and don't you think the Holy Spirit speaks to us through his Absolutely. word? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. we're, we're reading it. He touches our heart and shows us what he wants us to see in it. I've read the same scripture time, time and time again and find something different every time I read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, well, on over page uh, 81, I have that page marked. Yeah, a lot of page 81. So I'll just kind of um, go through it and tell you what I've got marked and then you can add, add to it or we can stop and talk about it for a moment. Um, up at the, this is the story that, that we read about the prophet who came to Jeroboam and said, stop doing this. Um, you're doing the wrong thing. And the prophet was told by God before he came not to eat or drink and not to go back the same way he came. Right. And mm -hmm. so then he, he, was, he was leaving and going back when a quote-unquote priest, which we know is not really a priest of God, but he came and said, you know, God told him. No, he said, an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord and said, come back to my house and eat and drink. And that prophet, knowing what God had told him, believed the other prophet, the false prophet, and did it. And I'm just thinking, 
how many times have I read the scripture and I know what's right. I know what the scripture says, but I've been led astray by someone who said, well, that scripture really doesn't mean that, or God won't punish you for that. Or, you know, that's just old. Um, that's just old thought. The, the new thought is this. How many times have we been led astray by a false prophet? Obviously, this man did, and then he died from it. So do you think it's fair that he, he, he got killed by a lion? Yeah, because he didn't obey God. He didn't obey God, but the, the other prophet told him, said, God said this, yeah. you know? The angel of the God. The angel said it. So and then who, he takes the man and buries him. Who do you believe? I think well, he's guilty. <laughs> well, it says this is such a helpful reminder to ensure that we always seek firsthand information rather rather than settling for secondhand. Mm -hmm. yeah. So his firsthand information came from God, and that's who he should have listened to. Right. Was it directly God or the secondhand? Right. Yeah, because. And she does make it clear to us because us is reading this story. We might not catch the fact that the old, that the prophet, the, the false prophet lied and said, an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord. So he didn't say God spoke to me is another one of those false, you know, things. Yeah. False interpretation is what it was. Well, um, so back up to that second full paragraph there. She says, you know, we may be thinking that this is incredibly unfair that the first prophet, you know, was killed. And we want, she says, we want fairness to work the way that we think it should. But maybe we just need humility today to lay down our questions for now. Have you ever thought about that? Fairness, can we truly say God's not fair? No. I, I've heard it and I've said it myself. Mm -hmm. He was a good woman and she had cancer and died. That wasn't fair because there's plenty of other people that weren't good people that should have died instead of the good person. You know, I've said it myself. But is it wrong to question God? No. We do it. <laughs> he knows our hearts. Yeah, he, he knows you're going to do it anyway. Jenny? Yeah. <laughs> yes. We were. We were talking about, is it okay to question God? And is, does that mean distrust? Do we distrust God if we question him? No. I know my way it is no. my search for the answer. Yes. Or the search for truth. And like she says here, God may not answer our question. We may just have to live with it until we get to heaven. And we raise all hands. And, and then we get to ask those questions that we always, but by the time we get there, they may not <laughs> still be questions. Yeah. yeah, they may not still be questions. But at some point, there are no answers unanswered well, prayers that just reminded me my mother always says when i get to heaven i want to ask god why people are allowed to abuse little children the way that they do mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't understand that. right that's you know, hard how can a person be so incredibly evil that they do some of the stuff to these kids that they do mm -hmm. why is that allowed she wants to know that if you've never watched the movie The Shack, what? The, the Shack. Shack. Oh yeah, that's a great book too. It it kind of helps us see it from a different way. Not saying that I can be God because there's no way I can be God. But <laughs> no, but it's just that's another one of those questioning things. Right. Why, why does why does God allow this? And you go back and God's not really allowing this. He's not the one doing yeah. that. But. Yeah. It happens because of sin. That's right. for sure. And then down at the bottom, uh, the, the bottom two paragraphs are almost, it says, also notice how the old prophet's false message told the man of God to do everything that the Lord initially had told him not to do. 
the man of God had every opportunity to go directly to the Lord to inquire of him, but he chose not to. He chose to believe a message that was contrary to what God had already told him. Why do you think he chose to believe it? He was tired and hungry. He was thirsty. He was hungry. And he was tired. He'd been traveling. And this guy said it was okay to do it, so... Okay. So there we go. Adam, there you go. We, we make mistakes when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're thirsty. Or when something looks good. Or when something looks better than what we've got, we make mistakes. And then she goes on to that last paragraph and says, however, let's remember the good news for us today. As believers... We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is our helper. He guides us into truth and illuminates the brilliance and depth of God's word to us. So we have no need to fear God's word. We can go directly to the word and know the spirit will help us as we study and pray. So as you're studying your Bible, even if it's only 10 minutes a day, Put it somewhere where you can pull it out, look at it on your phone, in paper, whatever. Speak, speaking of which, I'm going to detour just a moment. What about the cards in the back? Of people, have you been taking them out and posting them? Okay, we'll do it tonight. Take the, tear you out these cards and put them someplace where you'll remember. And then that'll, that can also give you something like take one card per day. And look it up in the Bible. Read the verses before it. Read the verses after it. Do a little, you know, Bible study on your own. And there's a place on the back of the card where she asks a question. And then you can fill in your ideas about that verse, what it means to you. So just a side note there. <laughs> All right. So anyone have anything else they want to focus on? from this um, study, this week two of the homework. Page 83. No, I didn't. What do you have marked, Jenny? Um, okay. There is a tremendous reminder for us today to always turn to the word of the Lord when we are in doubt. God has given us his word as a gift. He helps inform us in, as a means by which we can learn. It means to be comfort into the image of Christ. Conformed into the image of Christ. God's word is shaping us to become more like Jesus. This is called sanctification. That's right. Yeah, we forget that his word is a gift to us. Without it, we would be lost. And we would have to depend on, you know, preachers and priests and prophets to tell us what God says. The bottom of page 83? Yes. yes. God designed your souls to be married, comfort, challenged, and threatened by his word. Being healed after the truth of this truth is what helps us become our, our fears and Then we are more free to experience his faithfulness and our trust in him than good. Yes, that's true. Amen to that. All right, well, if... Um, I think we'll go ahead and watch our video from session three. So that's on page 88 for your notes. If you want to turn there and then I will see if I can figure out how to do this. So, there we go. And Okay, so Sharon and Carol, can you hear the audio? Can you 
hear the audio? Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, it's actually slipping in and out. Oh, it is? Okay, let me check with Steve. Today we're at Tel Dan in northern Israel at the foot of Mount Hermon, and it's very tragic in light we're of not the seeing it. Okay, hold on one second. This is where one of the golden calves was placed by Jeroboam and demonstrates such a I don't think I shared it to their screen. How long did this year have been back? Do we know? Yeah, it says in there. Or it's it's been that grab thingy somewhere. Like 41 years. So how long it ruled or how long he was king? Okay. I think. There we go. Maybe 30 years. From 930 to 909 BC. 930 to 909? Uh-huh. That's it. Okay, thank you for telling me. Today we're at Tel Dan in northern Israel at the foot of Mount Hermon and it's very tragic in light of what we learned about Jeroboam in our homework last week. This is where one of the golden calves was placed by Jeroboam and demonstrates such a departure from him trusting God. You're also looking at a high place. A high place was like a platform, a stage. You could dance on it, and if you placed an altar there, you could make sacrifices on it. And I wanted you to have a picture because high places are mentioned so much in scripture. I wanted you to see it so that we could translate it from this place into places in our life where we're gonna step on a platform or step on a stage. It's an elevated place, keep that in mind. And what Jeroboam did was he placed a golden calf on this platform. He not only did this here in Tel Dan, but also in Bethel. You know, a lack of patience positions us to depart from God's ways and manipulate things that we want. Anytime we depart from God's ways, we depart from fully trusting Him. When I was in my early 20s, I had a boyfriend that lived across town from me. And you know, what started out as just kind of a simple justification to sometimes let him sleep on the couch eventually led to full-blown sin. As I look back at why I made this departure from God's best that I knew was wrong, there were several reasons. I lacked patience. I got tired of waiting until we were married. I liked having him with me, and I got tired of saying goodbye. I got tired of trusting God for the future that I wanted. And I just decided to take things into my own hands now. But this decision that I justified, it only multiplied heartbreak upon heartbreak in my life. I can honestly look back now and see this one decision led me to making other decisions that demonstrated such a lack of trust in God and a whole lot of trouble in my life. The downside of that season of my life is that it led to sin, which had consequences. And honestly, it had consequences that I wish to this day I could go back and redo. God's grace and forgiveness have certainly brought about redemption, but given another chance, I definitely would have made different choices. We probably all have made decisions in moments of not wanting to wait on God and making decisions to take things into our own hands rather than trusting God that we wish we could go back and redo. But I bet you can also look back on those times, like me, and see that those seasons of life provided lessons that warn us from making those same mistakes today. While I can still be forgetful and impatient at times, I can still try to manipulate situations like I want them, I've learned a lot. As a matter of fact, just this week, I had a situation where I had to make a choice whether to follow what seemed like kind of a silly, unnecessary rule or 
take things into my own hands and rush the process of getting what I wanted. No one would have really known if I broke this rule, but I would have known. It was a clear test to see whether I wanted what I wanted more than I trusted God. Trusting God could have meant that I lost the opportunity I wanted, but not being patient and not trusting God would have meant that even if I got the opportunity, I would have to live with the reality that it was my doing and not God's blessing. And that's a heavy cloud that would have quickly overshadowed the joy of getting the opportunity and could have actually made the opportunity so tainted that there would have been a complete lack of joy altogether in the end. You know, that's how I identify from departing from trusting God. I have this little checklist, going where God told me not to go, looking at something God told me not to look at, partaking in something God told me not to partake in, saying things God told me not to say, being impatient with something God told me to be patient with. For example, instead of trusting God with your desire maybe to go after a significant assignment, maybe you try to gain a quick sense of significance by name dropping or making sure people know about your accomplishments. What gives us a quick hit of importance short circuits the security of Mortal. earth. You only feel as validated as the last compliment from others. And you or I, we can quickly start impatiently chasing praise, chasing people pleasing, and cravings to be valued instead of patiently following God and trusting Him. The sad thing is, a true sense of worth can't ever come from other people. Only God can give this. But when we get caught in the cycle of distrust, this cycle of manipulation, isn't it tragic that God is the last one we tend to see? In our study last week, we can see this playing out in the life of two kings, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, and Jeroboam. Rehoboam should have been the king of all of Israel, but then when the kingdom splits, Jeroboam becomes king of the northern tribes. And if you haven't done your homework this week, it might be a little confusing, so definitely go back and unpack that. First, let's look at an example of a lack of patience, a lack of humility, and a lack of true trust in God in the actions of Rehoboam. Like I said, the kingdom would ultimately be divided and torn away from Rehoboam. But let's take a closer look at some of the details in Scripture. In 1 Kings 12, 6 through 11, this passage helps give us indicators of possible motives of distrust. 1 Kings 12, starting in verse 6, Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. You see, being a servant does not seem what Rehoboam wants to do. He takes the advice of the young men that grew up with him and probably wouldn't stand up to him and incite him to treat his people with increasing cruelty. Notice what these men tell Rehoboam to say in 1 Kings 12, verse 10, B. My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs, or some translations say waist. Now, this may seem really odd and something none of us today would ever dream of saying, but in the ancient world, to be larger or thicker was a sign of wealth, status, and power. It was all prideful, bragging things that he trusted and that made him feel quite self-reliant. The ultimate consequence of doing this his way, rather than God's way, would be the division of the kingdom. Now, we know this because after Rehoboam makes life even harder for the Israelites, they rebel against him. They stone Adoram, the taskmaster of forced labor, and Rehoboam jumps into his chariot and flees to Jerusalem. 
While Rehoboam continues to be the king of the southern region, Judah, the rest of the kingdom is ripped away from him. And Jeroboam is made king over the rest of Israel. Now, don't miss this. Because of this situation, Rehoboam is now king of only the southern kingdom, and Jeroboam is now made king of the northern kingdom. And while I'd love to tie a big, beautiful bow around Jeroboam and say that he did everything right, I can't do that because we also find him exemplifying distrust and departures from God's ways. Jeroboam had such an amazing opportunity to be a very faithful king for Israel. After all, God had been so faithful to him. God saves him from the hand of Solomon. He gives him prophecy of the inheritance of the kingdom, and then God proves his faithfulness by actually making him king. If I were Jeroboam and all these people were recognizing God's faithfulness in my life and kind of looking to me as the it guy now, I'd really be feeling good and I'd really be feeling thankful. But feeling good and being thankful to God don't always go hand in hand. The next scriptures we read in 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, are filled with examples of a lack of patience and honestly, spiritual manipulation and a departure from the destiny God intended for Jeroboam. Now remember why we're here in Tel Dan. This was one of the altars that Jeroboam set up as an alternate place of worship. He doesn't want the people he's now leading to go back to Jerusalem and start following Rehoboam, who is in Jerusalem leading the southern kingdom. This is so important. What Jeroboam is doing is practicing replacement theology by replacing the time and the place of worship that God ordained and established. And even if they did go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, well, they were still invited. Come on back. Also worship at Tel Dan because the time was changed to be exactly a month after when the Israelites were supposed to go and worship at the temple. In other words, so the people who still did go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple there, when they came back, they had an opportunity to enjoy this place. It was crazy. God did not give Jeroboam permission to do this. He made it all up out of his own fear, deceit, self-promotion, and ultimately, self-protection. And don't we do the same thing? We aren't satisfied with God's timing, so we create our own timing. We don't trust the places that God is going to take us, so we navigate our own path and create our own places. Okay, now let's read the text in 1 Kings 12, 26 and 27. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. That little phrase said in his heart, it may seem insignificant, but for the Israelites, the heart, in Hebrew you say it, lev, was the source of the will. This wasn't just an emotional response. It was a willful, deceitful decision. What he's doing to the people is manipulating them. He's leading them to believe he's following God, but he's not. He's leading people astray because his own heart has been led astray. He cannot possibly properly lead people when he can't even lead his own heart first. What he should have said in his heart is, I'm going to let God lead my heart. I'm going to stay true to trusting and following God. But that's not what happened. He spoke to his own heart instead of asking God to speak to his heart. Then, as he leads the people, he gives this appearance of serving the Lord. But in reality, he's really just serving himself and his agenda. This is spiritual manipulation. And the spiritual manipulation doesn't stop with the building of the temple and placing the golden calf. He names his sons after the sons of Aaron, giving the appearance of the priestly lineage. All these actions go against God. Honestly, I know this is a lot of history and a lot of Bible insight, but it really challenges me to lean in and to pay attention for myself 
This is one of the pivotal lessons where we get to see where trusting God rises and falls, and it's with our will. Ultimately, we make the decision to trust God or to not trust God with our will. Do I want what I want, or am I going to choose to obey God? Often when we read stories in Scripture, we can recall earlier examples of humanity's repetitive patterns. And honestly, I think it's important to pay attention to these, because if it was a repetitive pattern in that day, it's probably a repetitive pattern in this day. For instance, Jeroboam's placement of the golden calves brings to remembrance the idolatry of the Israelites in Exodus 32. I imagine the Israelites honestly started to just get impatient with Moses. Moses had been up on that mountain for so long. It was time to take things into their own hands. And here's the deal. We fear the unknown. We do not know how to deal with the unknown. And when this happens, we lose trust and we take circumstances into our own hands. It's what we do today. It's what the Israelites did with the golden calf while they waited for Moses. And it's what Jeroboam did in placing the golden calves and setting up alternative places of worship. They were doing exactly what we talked about earlier that indicates a departure. Remember that little checklist that I talked about? They were going where God told them not to go. They were looking at something God told them not to look at. They were partaking in something God told them not to partake in, saying things God told them not to say, being impatient with something God told them to be patient with. And the consequences for okay. Jeroboam were severe. Okay. okay. I'm trying to think that has something. I got part of it last time, so I can just get the Got it? Yeah. Okay. Patient was something God told them to be patient with, and the consequences for Jeroboam were severe. Though he started out with such promise, in the end, he's listed as one of the most evil kings of Israel. While King David was the model often pointed to with good kings, Jeroboam becomes the one pointed to in reference to the evil kings. And the way the king goes, the people go. The people willfully give up their relationship with the living God for false gods. And the consequence, it was catastrophic. The people become just as empty as the false gods they keep turning to. Much later, the prophet Isaiah unpacks the reality of the worthless nature of idols that man creates with their own hands to reflect themselves. Isaiah 44, 14 through 17 says... He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak, and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts it, and is satisfied. Also he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Then let's also look at Isaiah 41, 29. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. Ultimately, what this passage points out is the danger of spiritual manipulation and worshiping solutions of our own making. And isn't that what all these idols represent? 
A departure from trusting God happens because we think too lowly of Him and too highly of ourselves. However, when we think highly of God, we think rightly of ourselves. Not too high, not too low, but just right. Then we are free to simply trust God and enter into His desire for us to experience the goodness, beauty, and security of His presence, something that idols of our own making can never achieve. Let's close today looking at Jesus, the King of Kings, how He modeled for us to remain close to God even when we're afraid. When Jesus taught us to pray, one of the first lines of the Lord's Prayer is addressing the will and keeping our focus on God's will to be done. Not my will, not how I think situations should turn out, not my suggestions or even solutions of my own making, but instead daily pursuing God's will and verbalizing my trust in Him. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, we're back. We're live. <laughs> so we lost Carol Farrell, but Sharon Johnson's still with us. So <clears throat> I think Carol probably already seen the video. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what did we think about this video? It got, yeah. It, it. it got to you. Yeah. It got she didn't pull any punches with it. Down and this is the way he is. Did you kind of relate with what she was saying? We do the same thing over and over, over, again. And over, and over again. Make the same mistakes. So how can we figure out when we're no longer trusting God. What, can you think of any clues or things that would help you identify when you move from trusting God to doing your own thing? Sometimes you think, well, maybe God's too busy or God's not concerned, you know. Or it's, it's not big enough for God yeah. to worry God with. I can do it myself. Yeah, I can do it myself. Until it falls in pieces. Falls in pieces. Mm -hmm. So if we if we did that, let's say we to have a trigger that knew that we we start doing things that kind of lead us away from God. How far do we go before we realize that we've moved too far away? Sometimes too far, way too far. Sometimes we go a long way before we look back, don't we? <laughs> Yeah. And the year still for me, which is what she was saying in the beginning there, that nobody else was going to know. Nobody going to know that you missed that dot or you didn't fold that sheet three times instead of two or whatever. You know. Or who's going to question your spirituality? Yeah. Nobody's I mean, who's going to call you on it when you're not doing, right. when you're doing something other than what God wants you to do? Somebody <laughs> will. 
<laughs> well, we hope somebody who loves us will point it out to us, don't, don't we? Usually when we get a long way down the road, like you said, life gets... Yeah. Life gets in the way, it, and then you realize that you done messed up. I mean, it's time to halt and do an about face and go back. Go back and we walk that nasty, dirty road back around. Sometimes we see people who get down that road and they think God won't take them back. Oh yeah. Think about the prodigal son who who finally gave up and went back thinking there's no way my father will accept me as a son, but maybe he'll let me be a servant and I can, you know, live in, in his, under his household. And yet other people use other means to numb the pain that they have in their life. Drugs alcohol, sex, gambling. But you don't want to tell people you shouldn't be doing that. The church because then you would have to be accountable. The church doesn't even want to tell you. That's true. Because they would have to become accountable and they would have failed you in some way or another down the road. Because you go back to the phrases, don't judge other people. And I have a problem with that mm -hmm. because we make judgments every single day. Mm -hmm. Do I choose to work with that person over there because maybe what they're doing is not what I need to be doing? That's a judgment. Maybe not in the spirit of the word judgment, but you make a choice and choices can sometimes be judgments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I think we've become very remiss in our responsibilities, just even as a human being, and letting people know when they've started down those paths as a good friend, maybe that's not a wise thing for you to do because guess what? It's none of my business what anybody else is doing. That's their life. They can do whatever they want. It doesn't affect me. But a lot of times it does. And I think, I think all of us are very remiss in our responsibilities to say, hey, maybe that's, you know, maybe we need to watch that because it can run a friendship. It can run, it can run a marriage. It can run your family because you don't want to say you're not supposed to be doing those things. Is there a way to say it without passing judgment? No. Sometimes. Maybe. Could you say... It seems like you're making choices that aren't in line with God. I, one time I saw this, um, I guess it was a YouTube video where the man went into the grocery store and he was checking out and he looked at the woman and he not without even knowing anything about her, he just said to her, How's your relationship with Jesus? And she just broke down and started crying. And so he wasn't necessarily pointing out anything she was doing wrong, although I'm sure she was, is the reason she was away from Jesus. But he just brought her back to the place because she had a knowledge of who Jesus was or else she would have, you know, probably said something different to him when he asked her that question. But I'm wondering if we couldn't just, you know, mention that to people and say, you know, maybe it's time to go back to God. Maybe it's time to seek his will or maybe, you know, just encourage them in their walk with God so that they'll turn back to him. If you see somebody who hasn't been to church in a while, sometimes that was my first thought when we were talking about things that we do that just make kind of make a snowball is when you stop uh, worshiping God or you stop reading your Bible or you stop praying to God. And it's just easier every week to keep doing those things. And, and nobody calls you and says, hey, where were you Sunday? And, and there's no accountability in that. Um, I know I've gone Sunday mornings and thought, well, so-and-so's not here. 
Should I call them? It never enters my mind. I just think, oh, well, they'll be here next week, and I'll say something to them then, that we missed you. And I usually do. If they weren't here, I'll say, I missed you last week. But then if they don't come back, at what point is it our responsibility? To say, hey, we miss you. To call them or send them a card and say, hey, haven't seen you in a while. Just missing you. Yeah. Um, another question that she asks is, what did you learn about Jeroboam from this video or from your Bible reading? If you read for the, the Bible verses that she mentions at the first of the, the homework session. Um, I didn't realize he was thought of as bad all day as one of the worst kings. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't either. Know that. Mm -hmm. that was new to me yeah, too that he was one of the worst kings in and I'm not sure why he's any worse than well I guess because Solomon started out as following God's commands and then gradually moved away but because he built the temple and maybe even still worshiped in the temple himself, but just allowed the other idolatry worship going on. Maybe he was a better king. But we're looking at the beginning of the kings here, I guess. So Jeroboam would be the first king that flat out never worshiped God and just worshiped idols and at no and even when he was warned by that prophet that God sent to him he didn't change whereas you know when God pointed out to David hey you messed up David repented and came back um, and Solomon to an extent continued on doing some of the things God wanted him to do. So I guess Jeroboam's the first one who didn't repent and did not follow God's ways, maybe. Anybody have any other thoughts about Jeroboam? <clears throat> the other thing she talks about is timing. Anybody got any experience with waiting on God's timing? Usually not very patient. <laughs> <laughs> Instant gratification kind of thing most days. What about us controlling things and doing things in our own time rather than waiting, waiting on God's time? Does anybody do that? Time. Probably do it more than we realize. Probably so. Mm-hmm. Instead of waiting. Mm -hmm. I think about like jobs that like taking a job or changing jobs or retiring from a job and you think it's all your decision instead of asking God if it what he wants you to do. What about the Lord's Prayer? Did what she say about that kind of, had you ever thought about that or heard that before? G what, did, what did she say? Again? That Jesus starts the prayer by saying, Thy will be Thy done. Will be done. Yeah, yeah. And that's like we should start everything. <clears throat> well, and it comes back to trust. Can we trust God's will? If we're going to say, thy will be done, can we trust him? 
Well, you hope we can. You hope and and not force our will. And yeah. And, and, take it back and, take it back. and do what we think our will says is the right thing to do. Because a lot of times we may be convincing ourselves that our will is really God's will. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How else can you justify what you do in your life? <laughs> Good <laughs> point. <laughs> Yeah. You really wanted this to be this way, God, and no did. You wouldn't have led me to this place if you, you didn't expect this. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's interesting. This next week we'll have our homework and. Um, We'll cover that before we start our video. We are recording these so that in the event that you or anyone else can't be here, you can always come back and watch the recording and hear the discussion and watch the video. Uh, so it's always there. And Steve has it set up on the church website is where it's at. And there's sessions, you know, we didn't record session one but we did record session two. This one is session three. So then next week we'll record session four also. If you know anyone who uh, wants to watch it or join in, then just you feel free to, to share that with them. So um, I failed to start our class with a prayer, but we'll be sure and end our class with a prayer. Would anyone like to pray tonight? <clears throat> dear lord our heavenly father thank you god for meeting with us tonight thank you for your holy spirit who speaks to our hearts who speaks to us through your scripture who speaks to us through the video with lisa it gives us insight into your word we thank you god for the examples of the kings and their mistakes and we just pray god that you'd help us to apply those to our lives and see our mistakes. Help us to trust you, God, that you will always be there for us, that you will lead us in the right direction, and that if we can be patient and be still, you will speak to us and you will show us the way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So sharing come next next Wednesday. Can somebody take Jenny home next week in case I don't make it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope I'll be here, but I'm not going to come. So, actually, I'm going to be okay.